Are you seeing it now? Yeah, it's physical. Okay. Um, there you are. So, so uh, please do point, point me out if, if, I'm, if I lose out on my voice or anything. Uh, so there we go now. So if you look at this, uh, this slide, this is a, a wider sweep of uh, what we call Hindu Kush Himalaya region. And uh, this is obviously a global asset. So if you see on the extreme uh, top, uh, this is Karakoram Pamir, and then um, you have all the way this uh, half crescent, uh, which is uh, shared by this big land form is shared by eight countries, and uh, what we call uh, commonly referred to as Hindu Kush Himalaya. And this is a, a food, energy, and water security um, asset for carbon and cultural and biological diversity as well. Uh, so if I go here, uh, <clears throat> if you look at on the water slide, you have 10 major rivers coming from this area in the Hindu Kushimala region. There's about eight countries, as I said, sharing this, uh, this particular landforms. And 240 million people actually live in these mountainous regions. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it, of course, in India, uh, uh, India, Indian population in the... Um, in the Himalayas, there's about, uh, about 50 to 60 million people in, in India are sitting in the Himalayan region. So overall, in eight countries, there are 240 million people in the Escape Mountains. So I think if you look at the downstream side, because many of the ecosystem services from the uh, mountainous regions uh, benefit people downstream. So there's about 1.65 billion people downstream also get benefit because of the ecosystem services flowing from the Hindu Kush Himalayas. And uh, uh, on biodiversity front, we look at uh, this is uh, it, it shares three biodiversity global hotspots. But I think what is also important to look at is the high degree of endemism, particularly in the northeastern side of this Hindu Kush area. Equally important is that between 1998 to 2008, 25 new species on average were discovered each year in the eastern Himalayan alone. But we also need to look at there are huge challenges to the biodiversity. And uh, so there, is, there are the studies uh, how much have we already lost and what are we going to lose by 2100, 2100. And particularly the endemic species loss would be great, very, very significant. And this is more so when 62-85% of rural population of Hindu Kush Himalaya depends on the biodiversity. Now we just go to the, <clears throat> if you look at this particular slide, so this is a distribution of the, the population in this region uh, and uh, how a decision making happens. If you look at the darker spots, is where uh, these are the capital in India, if you look at the capital city of Delhi and then you look at in, even in China. And what we really want to say is that uh, since mountain region is very uh, sparsely populated, completely sparsely populated, the decision making centers actually are not in the mountains, they are somewhere else. And uh, as we were sharing in the, as Shivaji was also sharing, there's a rich biocultural diversity of, uh, this is a diversity. So look at the living languages, there are more than 1,000 living languages in this region. And uh, the unfortunate part is this is such a richness of these languages. Um, more than 50% languages actually might be dying out. They actually end in that as per the UNESCO report, uh, which came, I think, in the late uh, 2010. And so I think we are saying that what happens here affects nearly one fourth of the humanity. We are looking at 1.65 billion people downstream as well. Now, See, see among the colleagues, you can see here. So one of the things which ISIMO as an intergovernmental organization of eight countries did, uh, it carried out the assessment uh, on a whole lot of these thematic areas from biodiversity to glaciers to river basins to energy uh, and so on. And uh, if this report actually is more or less like an IPCC report, but 
it's, it's it. and uh, it has been actually uh, it has found a huge traction uh, across the uh, continents in the global media and you can see the downloads how many have happened and uh, this continues to be it continues to remain one of the, the hot uh, selling uh, of course it is not a selling in, in that sense because this is a free download but i think it's been it's been followed and twitter and so on and so forth because this assessment report was actually done by more than 350 scientists from hindu kush himalayan region and uh, we will see number of authors write shops and it remains an open access published by the springer nature now what does this assessment report uh, say on hindu kush himalaya then that is where the himalaya calling comes here look at the poverty side and the himalayan region hindu kush himalayan region uh, <coughs> It fares really poorly compared to the national average in each of these countries. Uh, one third of the mountain population actually is below poverty line, compared to one fourth, which is the national average. And yet we are not talking about the Hindu Kush Himalaya, so across eight countries. And this is very significant: the food insecurity. Thirty percent of the actual population suffers from food insecurity. More important, I think, you have to look at is fifty percent suffers from malnutrition. Given the fact that Himalayas have been repository of agrobiodiversity, and many of these agrobiodiversity crops actually are nuclear cereals. Now, of course, you can see that some of the governments, including government of India, has launched something which is very, very important to really support the nuclear cereals or the crop diversity in the mountains. And but in the business as usual scenario, traditional food systems are replaced by the conventional crops um, and most of the mountainous region people also have this huge human wildlife conflict to raising uh, agriculture cultivating agriculture is not easy job out there and uh, if you see the uh, stunting of children uh, below five years and uh, we have these figures now for all the eight countries india also doesn't fare too well in this if you look at energy poverty there is a huge potential, but this potential of water and hydro is uh, has yet to be fully harnessed. And what is significant is 80 percent of the rural population in the mountains still lacks clean energy for cooking, and that is that is a telling story. And this is again a competitive statement based on the 2014 data for all the eight countries. Now what we are saying is here, this 1.5 degree centigrade, this is coming from uh, Paris Agreement. Even if all the countries put together their heads and the heart, um, and of course, head and heart come together, then I think resources, and they're able to do 1.5 degree by 2100, even this is too hot for the mountains. This is, I think, also coming out very strongly. So mountains might be warming up to 2.1 degree set, uh, Celsius. Uh, on an average, if if global average is 1.5 degree, then my mountains might be going to 2.1 degree if it is capped at 1.5 uh, global average temperature from the pre-industrial. But if we do business as usual, the mountains might actually go up to 5.5 degrees Celsius. This is this is the catastrophic scenario if that happens. I hope uh, we can. Uh, we can make the things happen and I think try to limit one point, up to 1.5 degree and see that what else can be done in the mountains. Uh, this is, a, if you are able to see this slide, it's a, if you can keep your eyes on this slide. and I'll, So this is a time series slide uh, <clears throat> which is done by uh, a photographer, David Birchier. Uh, he's picked up one slide from uh, Royal Geography and uh, 1921 and then he has done another one uh, you see that how uh, the area which is which are this is point photographs from uh, 21 and then this is a more recent 2009. So I, I I play this slide once again. I go back and look at this uh, the glacier mass and keep your eyes on the same point. If you if you do that, then you see what how this has changed to the glacier lake. 
And this is actually happening not only in one point, this is actually the other side of the Mount Everest. Um, so this is happening across the Himalayan region, in that huge Himalayan region. More and more retreat happening, and then the glaciers they've been formed. And you know that glacier late flood outburst, I think part of the reason of the Kedarnath uh, disaster was block, uh, glacier lake flood outburst. And this is happening actually because of the warming. Uh, we, know that, uh, we have already done, we reached about one degree Celsius temperature rise, but in mountains it has already gone up to 1.5 degrees. So this is the difference in the mountains, we say we, because there is an elevation dependent warming which happens, and that creates problem for the mountains. And uh, so on, so forth for many other elements, including the biodiversity. And now these are the projections from our assessment report. <laughs> so what does it say? If it's 1.5 degree global average temperature capped at 1.5 degree, then we will still lose one point one third of the total volume. But if the business as usual scenario happens, then two, two thirds of the volumes uh, the glacier mass actually uh, will be lost in the current emission scenario. And uh, that will be a catastrophe. So I think that the mapping has been done uh, from west to east, what happens in the west and what happens. So it will, one, in 1.5 degree, while the average temperature in mountains will go on 2.1 degree, but this will vary from as you move from west to east. <coughs> to look at this one from Ladakh, <coughs> and if you look at the far side of this, slide, if you are able to see that, there are these glaciers. And actually, these glaciers are retreating glaciers, and the snow melt is happening. And many of these valleys in Ladakh, if you see the agriculture and green, it's because of the glacier uh, runoff. And if you have the glacier and snow melt happening uh, at the rapid pace, uh, it's very difficult to imagine how this, these valleys will remain green. <coughs> And also on the waterfront, if you go from west to east, uh, the global warming is not going to impact all the regions of the mountains in the same way. On the western side, it is most of the water actually comes from glaciers and glacier melt. The warming actually will increase the glacier melt and also will increase the runoff from there. But this will happen only at, in the certain point and then they will decline. But in eastern side, because of the run, uh, runoff will increase because of mainly because of the precipitation. So uh, I think it's a very unevenly distributed impact of uh, what will happen in the in the mountains because of the change in temperature. But I think what is important that we are seeing it already in the mountains and also downstream. The extreme events actually are happening more and more, which we can see in terms of floods and droughts. So the uncertainty actually is increasing. Also significant is the springs because in India, and particularly in India itself, I think in the Himalayan region is the back of the envelope calculation. The broader estimate is about 5 million springs are there. Now, the 5 million springs in the Indian Himalayas, roughly 50% actually are reporting reduced discharge and 30% are already dying. So, I think this is a serious alarm because springs do contribute to the uh, water security in the mountains. So I think with this, uh, with this, uh, some of these uh, scenarios uh, in the mountains, uh, uh, which was done in the assessment report. Uh, so, so I think what happened in the assessment report, we looked at these different thematic elements, looked at uh, projections, did the modeling, uh, secondary data, and then said, yes, now we have some data uh, and. Uh, Earlier, the problem was IPCC 4 and IPCC 5 uh, did not deal with the Himalayas in particular, Himalayas in particular, and this was seen as a data deficient region. And this assessment, which was released last year, actually has tried to uh, provide uh, to a very large extent the information and data. Plus, there are national level efforts which have been done in each of the country. Some countries have done more than others, like India has been on the forefront, uh, so is probably China, because China, uh, their research uh, and assessment actually is also very strong, and uh, 
But in other countries of this region, uh, some of these countries actually are, uh, are very, very, very data, data deficient for their region. So there is now one data for the entire region as a wider sweep, and it provides a lot of information. So we have now, uh, and this is a free downloadable data, and we have the regional uh, database in, uh, in the CIMUD, and uh, this RDBS uh, <coughs> provides support to uh, the country uh, data, um, data sharing platforms, and it works closely with many of these countries uh, for uh, building capacities uh, for data and, and, and information. So when you have the data, then you, have, you can have no reason to say that now uh, we do not have information, so difficult to act. So we have enough information now to act. More information is always welcome. More research, more data is always going to give you uh, more granularity and uh, better information for decision making. But you have now good information to decide and take good actions for the mountains so that uh, both adaptations as well as the mitigation measures can become possible. So what is that? Uh, so after the assessment, the real story actually begins after the assessment. So now we have this information, now we have this data on biodiversity, species, habitats, uh, water, glaciers, atmosphere. Uh, so what do we do? And, and, and the social economic data like on poverty, energy security, food security, malnutrition, and so on. Now, this is what I think the questions which we posed last year with the national governments uh, in eight countries. And it came out with a vision which is which actually looks at more prosperous, poverty-free, and peaceful Hindu Kush Himalayas. Also to share with you that this area is not the easiest of all. So the eight countries is highly sensitive geopolitical. So it's more Never, never produces any map which has any political boundary. It's not always produces map which has, which is biophysical. So which it shows you the landforms, it shows you all the other features, but it never puts the political boundaries for the countries to put their own boundaries. So the regional organizations we have to be very careful. And so we work across the boundaries, and we work using the science to bring the policy makers uh, in eight countries. Now. Eight countries are now co-creating what we call HKH call to action. So India is also going separately, Himalaya calling, but I think the larger Hindu Kush Himalaya call to action. And we have broadly categorized uh, these actions into six categories. Uh, if you look at these six present actions based on the assessment report and what came out from a whole lot of consultations uh, in eight countries, one is this uh, cooperation at all the levels across the HKH. You know, like the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, one thing which stands out is everybody feels now that this is the interconnected world. And, and uh, if one, only one country cannot really solve the problem. Uh, you have to really work together. And we are seeing the kind of collaboration happening even on the vaccine. So we have some how you have to really do the trials, how many countries you sample, how many, what is the population. So third stage trial brings more and more countries. I think so what one is trying to see, when you have the calamities and the uh, uh, challenges of this magnitude, so whether it's a COVID-19 or it is a climate change, the warming, and go back to the Paris Agreement, cooperation is required at all the levels, and Hitko Himalaya, the countries, will also have to cooperate. So one is government-to-government -government cooperation, then there is also people-to-people -people cooperations, there is a business-to-business -business cooperation, there is research-to-research -research cooperation, academia to academia. So I think at all the levels, uh, this cooperation has been understood. And, and luckily, I think I have one more slide which I'll be showing you how the ministers are going to come together in the next slides. So one is this uh, call. Second is, uh, I think all our efforts have to be made to see that you limit the global warming. We are, as a, as a global committee, the global warming is limited to 1.5 degree. Uh, even though the Paris Agreement says it should be below 2 degree, but it also says that we will strive towards limiting it to 1.5 degree. Uh, that will also mean 2.1 on an average for the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Ecosystems, because of the richness of ecosystems, biodiversity, but also serious threats of uh, how we are losing on the endemism in this area. And losing the habitat, habitat fragmentation. 
The resilient ecosystems are probably the only answer uh, to support the ecosystem services which the Himalayas and the Indian Ocean provide. And you know, even this particular pandemic has something to, something to do with the the way the ecosystems and the and the nature's uh, interaction, and the way human beings interact with the nature. So, uh, so there are a lot of action packages in this broader uh, category of uh, actions in the enhanced ecosystem resilience, so making the ecosystem resilient, and there are specific actions around that. Uh, the next section you see that recognize and prioritize the uniqueness of HKH mountain people. Even if you look at Himalayas, Himalayas you say is always unique. And from our time of Adi Shankar's, and uh, people have been coming to Himalaya for various purposes, various reasons, from the spiritual to just looking at the awe-inspiring uh, awe uh, landscapes and the beauty of the mountains. But also, I think people understand uh, the food, energy, and water security of a large part of the country depends on how we treat Himalayas in particular. Uh, so there is a uniqueness, but this unique has has to really be understood by not only people in the mountain, but also the people downstream. And see that how there could be a collective movement to uh, safeguard this uniqueness of the mountains and mountain cultures and, and biocultural bio diversity. We're also looking at the SDGs in the mountains. So like all the SDGs are not important and not, uh, not relevant to mountains. So the nine SDGs we have mapped. Um, and we call them nine mountain priorities which are consistent with the SDGs. So this, this mapping has happened and shared with all eight countries. And there has to be a more and more data and information sharing, sharing of the knowledge. Uh, CIMOD as intergovernmental organization provides the regional database. Uh, but I think each country has its own data uh, sharing policy and we, we as a regional intergovernmental organization respect all the, uh, what the country specific policies. But I think what is important now is share the information more and more uh, on the platforms and uh, whatever cannot be shared, this is fine. But I think a large bit of information in the scientific domain uh, is available and it can be shared to some good decision making. Okay, so I move to the next one now. Oh, this is, I was talking about uh, uh, increased collaborations. This is what we call power of aid. Uh, so the eight countries will be seeing the power of eight, and we are meeting of task force. We have a task force which is represented by additional secretary or joint secretary from each of these countries. Uh, the Modi Ministry is uh, Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change for uh, India, but in other countries, somewhere it is Ministry of Environment and Forest, and some other cases it is Ministry of Climate Change also. So, uh, depending on country-specific governance system, we have these. Uh, so what is going to happen if you look at the last <coughs> bullet item here on 15th of October, we will still have the virtual summit of <coughs> these eight mountainous countries. The ministers will be there for this uh, summit, the environment minister. And uh, we, we are hoping that uh, that there would be a possibility of a draft declaration uh, from this summit, which will uh, uh, have many of these elements like assessment report, recognition of call to actions. Uh, we are also thinking of science and policy forum. We have done one last year, but I think we wanted to do it a biennial feature, science policy forum. The scientists come, the policy makers come at the same time. We also have every two years, the first one is happening October, the ministerial summit. So that is the traction of the highest level, the political uh, traction where the ministers come and then the scientific evidences are with the with the political processes. And then I think they also decide that here's the science, here's the evidences, how we really not take it forward. So we are very positive uh, that people the past two years, not just I think 10 days from now, uh, we have this uh, summit coming up virtually uh, for the HK ministers. And uh, there we are also now uh, in to have this situation. <laughs> Okay, so what is uh, HKH calling the Himalaya calling? So Himalaya calling the government of India, also the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, under the National Mission for Himalayan Studies, uh, between EC Mode and D.B. Pant Institute, and supported by the Ministry of uh, Himalaya, Ministry of Environment and Forest. This has been now put in place. The Himalaya calling an awareness to action campaign. So this is about listening to the pulse of mountain and mountain people. So understanding what what are the things that are happening, and I think. Reversing the length and breadth, and then also seeing 
how people are now responding to the challenges. And um, so picking up the evidences, so there are a lot of partners are there uh, in Himalayan region who are working, uh, lending their ear to the ground, they provide, they're bringing in good evidences. Sometimes what is happening is when you have the evidence, the, the science, uh, the policy, which is taking the evidence to the policy makers is a problem. Taking the evidence to practitioners is sometimes become a last mile connectivity issue. So the Himalayan calling basically is a support system. It's being framed as a support system to many, many champions who are doing things, whether they are doing the research, they are doing, uh, demonstrating something, uh, but they're not able to upscale it or outscale it, or sometimes they feel that, no, we have done this in a smaller scale, but it's just not going on large one. Now, this is where the Himalaya Calling Initiative actually is, is trying to peg itself. Uh, so they are trying to build up support system, bring the science policy and practice constituencies together and see that who's over doing what, answering some of these questions, whether it is on the energy side, whether it is on the biodiversity side, the food and agriculture, water, springs, rejuvenation, and so on and so forth. Tourism, even mountain tourism provides a huge livelihood opportunity and and you know the mountain tourism has been bad so badly hit by the pandemic. They have to virtually reimagine the tourism now because the people have lost jobs, and uh, people who have come back to the mountains, the returning migrants. So they are the new set of skilled people who are there, but now but they are no uh, takers for that skill. So now the, the challenge with the government is basically is how do we uh, use the skills to help the people who would like to stay back in the mountains now. Many of them will definitely go back where from they came yeah, before the pandemic. And men, so we are still now projecting what could be that population uh, percentage. It could be 30 to 40 percent. But 30 to 40 percent people staying back, I think it's, it's a reverse migration. It is also a huge issue. We have to really make sure that the returning migrants' skills are used. And that is what the governments are also trying to see. So working closely with the national governments on this. So, and a lot of networking is uh, what is, uh, is, is envisaged under the Himalaya calling. So, you have a lot of thematic networks uh, and uh, knowledge network component of uh, this Himalaya calling is very strongly entered by Guru Pan Institute, uh, uh, which is based in Alboda. And uh, we hope that over a period of three years, this, uh, this initiative for the calling, Himalaya calling actually catches up and some, somehow it becomes... Uh, it, it can become a people's movement. This is what I think we are trying to gain. At the moment, it is also slightly affected by what happened uh, because of everybody is now uh, has his own story to tell about the COVID-19 impact on many of the initiatives which were started early this year. So we have also taken a little hit on this uh, Himalaya calling, but uh, whatever virtually can be done uh, is being done. So, uh, but I think I also would like uh, to invite uh, our friends here uh, people who are working in the mountains, please do get in, get in touch with us in, in this remote on Himalaya Calling. I think we need you, uh, and we need you for the reason that uh, Himalaya and the calling is for everybody. Anybody who listens to Himalaya uh, knows that what Himalayas now now are asking for uh, the commitment. And uh, but this, this initiative, which is now encouraged. Uh, this, three or four institutions, basically is to provide support systems to the work of the partners, basically. And any of you could be one of the partners out there. So that is it. Uh, uh, I have done my presentation, and uh, I will now stop uh, sharing this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would request the... Uh, delegates attending to uh, ask the sir some questions or uh, have a discussion with uh, Mr. Rakot on the issues that he presented. So basically I have one question sir, that uh, while working across these uh, eight countries and uh, in a fragile landscape that like that with a, with a very fuzzy boundary, political boundaries. So, must be, I have been a challenge. Can you share some experience related to that? Because it's an overlapping, it's overlapping almost all countries. Yes, you're very right. 
Um, so uh, I think working beyond boundaries, uh, for the boundaries bring sensitivities, we always look at, so we have this like uh, for our colleagues sitting here, we have a transboundary landscape program. So like, okay, I'll just give you a specific example, like transboundary landscape of Kailas sacred landscape. So we have three countries joining this program, uh, which have already completed the first phase, which is India, Nepal, and China. Uh, and it looks into about 30,000 square kilometer of the area uh, from Pithora, predominantly, I think, 10, uh, 8,000 square kilometer from Pithoragad itself, Pithoragad district, then the other side of Kali River uh, in Nepal, and then the uh, Mount Kailash and Mount Sarovar area in Pulan County in China. Now, so we have uh, tried to uh, see that this larger land forms, which forms the city of Kailash, uh, sacred land, transboundary landscape for biodiversity conservation and livelihood enhancement. And many of, like, so where you did this, Sakura Michael, uh, while you were there uh, in Madhupadeva and Chhattisgarh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, we have now the norms uh, which uh, get agreed by the, uh, by three governments. Uh, so, we have a regional steering committee mechanism. <clears throat> it's, it's never been an easy, but I think we have tried to bring the science up front. We have tried to bring the uh, um, the uniqueness of this region, uh, the scientific facts, the, the evidences, and uh, <clears throat> work closely with the state governments as well as with the national government, because each of our programs actually get vetted by the national government, including uh, other ministries, which actually also look at very from their close uh, angle. Uh, not only our ministry, but also it goes to the Ministry of External Affairs, also goes to the Ministry of Home Affairs, and now. So they all get the wet, wetting done, and then we, we take up these programs. Uh, it takes a little while, actually. Each program, new program, takes about a couple of years to get all the all the approvals in place. And then we have the institutional mechanisms to see that <coughs> there is a cooperation which can happen at the region. National, <coughs> excuse me, national partners work in the national boundaries, within the boundary. But the regional experience is shared using the SEO platform. So that is how we somehow keep the things uh, also clear that there's a regional experience that this country would like to... Uh, in fact, if you look at the biodiversity, this uh, act and uh, Nagoya protocol things, India did very well. So it was followed by Nepal and China. So they, they actually came to Pitaragar, they went to Uttarakhand Biodiversity Board, they spent some other time there, and they actually pushed in their own country legislation uh, based on what India actually shared. So I think sharing from... <coughs> uniqueness of each country becomes very important. What evidence is being brought by one country? So, but nevertheless, I do uh, recognize what you are uh, saying that it is it's, it's never easy job. Uh, but we somehow, based on the core principle which we normally abide by, never putting a political boundary, always using the uh, landforms, geomorphological features uh, of Hindu Himalayas. It's for the countries to put their own boundaries uh, as they politically they want to decide. But we normally will steer clear of this. It's very much clear from our. So mm -hmm. if you look at map on Isimod website, you won't find this many boundaries. But they know that this is Delhi. This is this. This is this. Um, so I think steer clear uh, by not bringing too many boundary issues. <coughs> I think it helps a lot. And people really want to understand what is the evidence coming up. So we are just banking on good science good research, good evidence, and engaging the policy makers. Is there uh, uh, any, uh, are there any plans or attempts to network with various organizations in these countries so that, uh, so that the uh, all of Himalayas can be answered? Yeah. Sorry, I want to get more light. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, what plan of working with so ACMOD works through partners only. <clears throat> Each program, uh, we have a, uh, the profile partners and we work through partners. <coughs> we have one uh, recent program, uh, which is only three years program, which is called Himalayan University Consortium. So they are, they are the university and academic institutions also are partners. So 19 uh, Himalayan universities and uh, some of the institutions, including, including wildlife in Central India actually, uh, is now there. Uh, so, um, yes, partnership is key to us. If you're working in Himalaya, please do let us know. 
uh, if, if, uh, if your organization is working in Himalayas, definitely you will have more opportunities to work together. Hi, sir. Uh, Anjana here. I just, uh, I've been working on Ganga for a long time, since 2006. So I am interested in knowing a little bit more about the cooperation on transboundary rivers. And I see that you have two transboundary rivers that you're working on. One is Koshi and one is Indus. So for the Indus, uh, who are the partners in India that you're working with? Because I briefly worked uh, with India and with, with Pakistan on one of the projects on Indus uh, River Basin. But then who are the partners who you're working with in India on the industry? Oh, there are a whole lot of uh, people out there. Of course, one of our colleagues actually entered this program. Uh, one of our colleagues actually entered this program. Uh, <coughs> organization. Uh, Indian Institute of Crops and Vitrodi is on, on, on it. Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Divi from the NU. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. He's one of the very active members on this. Uh -huh. uh, I think Rupi is part of this uh, this initiative. Uh, so I think there is an India chapter on this index. Uh, uh -huh. and, and there are I I, I because some, I not normally get invited, but I have not, not been able to go the for one on this index uh, uh what they call this upper index basin network. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, India, yeah. India, India also has a chapter. So countries have their own chapters and then they bring together uh these networks as a uh, the four countries platform. So okay. I think these are the platforms in making. Uh, I think we're already there, but I think there are more and more partners also joining in that. So if you uh, uh, want to really be part of the Indus network, uh, please do write to us, and then I'll be able to bounce it off to my colleague, uh, who is Dr. Arun Sreshka. We anchor this from the CMO side. Uh, okay, so and, and do you also work on integrated river basin management? Uh, yeah, that is, uh, Anjana, this is, uh, I think this is the way to actually do it. But what we also are trying to do in our new... Uh, Sir, it was, uh, uh, what is the funding? Uh, uh, okay, I saw these two questions. One is funding issue and Anjana issue. So, uh, let me complete Anjana issue then I can come to this question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Anjana, this, uh, what we're trying to also now think in is transboundary, this biodiversity conservation issue, uh, landscapes plus the river basins together. Uh -huh. So, because the river basin gives you upstream downstream uh, view, no? Uh, yes, yes. Subject. And uh, horizontal, normally you get it from the transboundary landscapes. Uh, yeah. So, when you think in both, and I think it becomes beautifully, uh, it has more buying actually for the donors. When you uh -huh. get the river basin and when you say river basin, uh, integrated river basin management, I think obviously comes to uh -huh. So, I am, uh, my, my hope, and I really hope that time to come, this uh, landscape, uh, biodiversity and landscape programs and river basin programs actually will sink in very well because the catchments have to be secured, no? Yes. You know, watershed and catchments, they have to be secured and uh, your landscape will come. River uh -huh. state will come more from the vertical. Up yeah. and down, also from the disaster point of view. So, mm -hmm. how you can actually manage water, but also you look at how you can manage the disaster. Kosi, for uh, us, also is a good example because where we have this uh, uh, flood early warning systems uh, which are actually managed by a committee uh, in Ratu Kola, which feeds into Kosi River. Mm -hmm. So, we have done these, uh, we are gadgets which uh, have been developed. And uh, upstream in Nepal and also downstream in uh, We work very closely, closely in Bihar with the uh, uh, Bihar State uh, Disaster Management Authority, ESDMA, and the uh, Water Resource uh, Department, plus uh, organizations like Yvantar and uh, uh, the Civil Society Organization, as well as the government, with both of them, and also with the IIT Kanpur for Kosi. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. And then I think the good question. But I think I let me get back to my friend who's asking about the funding. Yes. So where do they get the funding? First of all, I think the first part of money comes from eight countries. Uh, the, the, the government provides money uh, as part of the, being the intergovernmental organization. Uh, but that is only uh, one part okay. of the year. But I think yeah. then there are also uh, funders who provide the core funding, uh, uh, which actually are Alps countries, because they help mountain countries. Uh, also look at Himalayas. Yeah, yes, sir. So that is Elf, Elf Mountain country, including Switzerland, the Germans, uh, but there are also Nordic countries uh, have so much of interest, like Arctic and uh, uh, Himalayas. They also, uh, like, even uh, Norway. Yeah. 
So, so there's one set of countries uh, providing for core funding, and then there are programmatic funding. Uh, so, so we do a lot of programs with the donors and uh, from Austria, Austria to, to different, of course, not different as the name of that, <laughs> the Germans, and so, so there are programmatic funding and there are core funding. Core funding has two components. One is the country funding, uh, each or eight member country, but China and India, they provide the maximum, followed by smaller country have a smaller share, uh, but China and India equal, equally they contribute. And uh, then some uh, European countries provide also core funding as well as the group of the program. There are certain comments, uh, Mr. Santosh Singh, uh, Dr. Santosh Singh. He has commented excellent analysis on the impact of climate change. And uh, Mr. Shah Vilal says uh, very informative. And uh, Mr. Divyang Chauhan has commented that great efforts and a, in a very and a really challenging task. So I would request the uh, attendees if they have any questions. Uh, I will request Dr. Anjana to extend the vote of thanks to Mr. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think we are reconnecting after a long time and it's been really, really interesting presentation and a very holistic one and insightful one. And uh, I thank you for this this wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I definitely want to further think about it and connect it with my work because a lot of my work is related to this. I also sincerely thank everybody who joined uh, this webinar. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thank you very much. Have a great evening. Uh, thank you, Anna. And thank you, Shivaji, for organizing this. Thank you, Shivaji, for giving me an opportunity to come here, use this platform, and also meet some of my old friends. Thank so you. Being with you. Being with you is always a pleasure, sir. <laughs> Physically as well as online. <laughs> and now Shivaji yes. will sing a song. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you going to sing a song? Well, sir, if you feel, if you feel I can like do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, should I, sir? Please, uh, yeah, at least few lines. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> I Bazaar, 
Thank you, sir. That was an icing on the cake. The technology, technology tried to play villain, but did not succeed. 